Um, today, we are going to be talking about uh, personal injury law, specifically, as you should see on your screen, understanding wrongful death law. And joining us today to talk about this is Mr. Christopher Davis. Uh, Mr. Davis is a, an attorney uh, based in Seattle, Washington, who um, runs his own firm, the Davis Law Group. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'm happy to be here and happy to talk about uh, a subject in the law that we get a lot of questions on and that we have represented in uh, several cases over the years, and that's the wrongful death case. And uh, my firm uh, devotes its pra my practice 100% exclusively to personal injury law. And in personal injury law, there are a number of different types of cases from you know, auto accidents to dog bites to catastrophic injuries and wrongful death claims. And uh, about three years ago, I decided to publish a, write and publish my first book, uh, The Ten Biggest Mistakes That Can Wreck Your Case. And you'll see right there on the screen that uh, since that time, I've published three more, and actually I've got a fifth one that's about to be published in a few weeks. And so I did this, uh, as far as my books go, to really educate the public and consumers and people who think they have claims and uh, just give them information, basic information, uh, because I think there's a lot of um, myths out there and misinformation that uh, is typically spread by the insurance industry. So with that said, let's talk about uh, wrongful death law. First of all, I, I want to preface my presentation here by stating that uh, wrongful death claims are incredibly complex. So um, I'm going to be giving you just a general overview on two fairly broad topics, but I'm going to try to narrow those topics as much as I can, just to give you some general understanding on some of the questions, common questions that we get about uh, wrongful death cases. And one of those questions basically is, you know, how do I determine the value of a particular wrongful death case? And um, there is no mathematical formula. Uh, and if there was, I probably would be out of a job because people wouldn't need a lawyer. They just would apply the formula. But um, there is no formula. And so there's a number of factors that exist that uh, actually influence or play a big role in helping attorneys and claims uh, adjusters to determine the value of a wrongful death case. And uh, the first uh, factor that we see Number one here is uh, losses and types of damages available under the law. And with the wrongful death case, there are only certain types of damages that may be recoverable that are actually recognized under the law. And so uh, obviously if there are, uh, in, in any given wrongful death case, if there are a number of damage, damage elements that are compensable, that is where the law allows a specific recovery, then the more of those elements that exist in every claim is typically going to increase the value of that particular case. And I know that sounds a little confusing, but I'll, I'll explain it a little bit further in the presentation. Number two, um, the strength of the family member's testimony. In a wrongful death case, we're obviously talking about the loss, uh, the wrongful uh, loss of a person and uh, the family members, certain designated family members, uh, may have a specific claim for the loss of, of their loved one. And how those family members um, present, how they testify, uh, how they come across uh, or may come across in front of a jury can play a very important role in the value of a case. And what I mean by that is if, if the family members uh, you know, come across as fairly, uh, fairly uh, genuine and sympathetic, if they're articulate, if they're trustworthy, if they had strong relationships with the deceased, uh, then that's usually going to uh, be a powerful motivator to a jury as far as assigning a value to the claim. Uh, the more sympathetic uh, the family members are, typically the higher the value of the claim. Um, number three, uh, the third factor, uh, the juror's perception of the person who's been killed and the life that that person led. Um, this really is common sense. Uh, you know, if, if the person who has been killed 
was a was a good member in society, if that person had a job, if that person was responsible, uh, was a good husband, was a good father or spouse or a parent, then generally that's going to increase the value of the claim compared with a person that perhaps uh, was not a good member of society. Maybe that person had a criminal record. Uh, maybe that person was uh, not very good as far as uh, their financial responsibilities. Maybe they declared bankruptcy in the past or had uh, a lot of debt and so forth that they didn't pay. So if, if the jury perceives that the person who has died led a very good life or an important life, then typically they may see that the death is a much greater loss to that person's family and hence um, assign a, a higher damage award. Uh, number four, uh, the amount of insurance available to pay a claim. Uh, typically, the value of a claim is going to be measured by what potential source of recovery there is to pay that claim. Let me give you an example. Uh, you may have a very strong wrongful death case. You may have a, a number of damage elements that maybe the case might be worth $3 million if uh, all of the damages were awarded. But if the person that, that caused the death, let's say it's a car accident, if the person only has $100,000 in insurance to pay the claim, uh, then generally that's the, the only amount that the family is going to receive, um, the, the, the amount of the policy limits that are, are applicable, applicable to the loss here. Now, Oftentimes I get a question of, well, yeah, even if there's only $100,000 in insurance, can't we just sue the person responsible and try to get more? Well, um, you can always sue. The question is whether you can collect. And so it's very, very difficult to try and time-consuming and expensive to try to collect a damage award above the policy limits. You've got to go after the person's personal assets. And that is uh, time-consuming and expensive. Uh, furthermore, even if you were to go to trial and try to get more from the person and their personal assets, even if they're wealthy, that person can always declare bankruptcy. And if that happens, then the debt or the judgment that you have obtained uh, is discharged. Um, and so the judgment is practically worthless except for the amount of the policy limits that may apply. So generally speaking, uh, the value of a claim is, is going to be measured by the amount of insurance that's available to pay that claim. Uh, number five, uh, one factor that can um, influence the value of a wrongful death case would be the, the identity of the wrongdoer and the severity of the conduct that actually caused the death. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, let's, let's take the car accident case. In, in one case, uh, the car accident was caused, let's say, by uh, a, an older lady, a grandmotherly type, who was on her way to church and simply uh, didn't see the stop sign and broadsided an, another person and killed that person. Um, compare that with an accident which may have been caused by uh, a person who is employed by a major corporation was drinking on the job and drove drunk and broadsided uh, another person, killing that person. Uh, you've got basically the same claim. They're both wrongful death cases. Uh, but in one of those cases, the, the person that caused the death is fairly sympathetic. Um, and a jury might not be willing to award a high damage award against a grandmother that simply made a mistake in their view. Um, in the other case, however, you've got a corporate defendant and you've got an employee that was drinking on the job and then chose to dr drive drunk. In that case, the, the conduct is fairly egregious, and especially with drunk driving cases, jurors become awfully angry at the defendant in those types of cases, and rightfully so. So they may uh, they may take out their anger uh, against the defendant by awarding a much higher damage uh, claim or damage uh, verdict. So the identity of the person or 
company or corporation that caused the death and the conduct that gave rise to the death can actually have a significant impact on the value of the claim overall. Uh, basically, you know, as, as a lawyer, I tried to uh, gauge how a, a group of 12 people, jurors, might see the defendant, whether they might see that person as evil or did doing something evil as opposed to somebody who uh, made an innocent, innocent mistake. And uh, the former is always, always going, the former type of case is always going to command a much higher uh, value than, than the latter. Uh, number six, um, the skill, ability, and reputation of your attorney. And um, uh, this seems fairly obvious. And uh, as I said before, wrongful death cases are very complicated. Uh, there can be multiple claims in one particular case. There can be multiple defendants. So you want an attorney, obviously, who has experience handling these types of cases um, and who has uh, gotten good results in these types of cases. Uh, the wrongful death case is going to be defended by the insurance company. The insurance company will be paying the defense lawyer. The insurance company will be making the decisions about strategy, how the case is defended, how many experts perhaps uh, the defense might hire. And they will also be very cognizant of the attorney on the other side. Does that attorney uh, have experience with these types of cases? Does that attorney have a reputation for taking cases to trial? Typically, lawyers who go to trial are going to command a higher settlement um, in a case than those lawyers who don't. And the simple reason is because the lawyer who goes to trial really presents a much greater risk to the insurance company that that lawyer might get a big verdict. And so uh, the insurance company is going to pay a premium to settle that case to avoid that risk of a big verdict. So these are six general factors that uh, typically go into uh, trying to value uh, the wrongful death case. But keep in mind that there may be a host of many other factors. Uh, in the case. Um, each case is different. Each case may have certain issues or facts involved that might affect the value. For instance, there may be legal issues in the case, and uh, depending on which way the judge might make a ruling on that issue, for instance, there may be an issue about what evidence uh, might, be willing, might, might come in at trial. And so it, it may not always be clear because a judge is granted with a large amount of discretion and so the value of that particular case might also hinge on what type of ruling the judge will make on a particular piece of evidence. If the law is strong in one side or the other in favor of that evidence, then that might increase the value uh, or lessen the value depending on which side the, the, uh, the issue falls in favor of. So uh, again, six factors, but there may be many, many different other factors depending on the facts of the given case. If we can go to the next slide. You there, Megan? Yes, I, I move to the next slide. Be. Okay, there it is. Right here. Sorry yep. about that. So um, uh, let's talk about the common types of wrongful death cases that we see. And I basically classified uh, the wrongful death case into three types of claims <coughs> excuse me, that may exist. Um, and uh, one is going to be the estate's claim. Uh, whenever a wrongful death case exists, the, the person that has died they have an estate that is recognized by the law. And that estate is similar to any other legal entity or person. <clears throat> and that estate has a claim for certain types of damages because of the death. Uh, number two, uh, there may also be a beneficiary's claim. And a beneficiary uh, is simply a, a surviving member, family member of the deceased that has been recognized under the law where that family member has a certain claim for damages due to the loss of their loved one. And in Washington, there are only certain 
family members that actually can pursue a claim, an individual claim, for the loss of their loved one. And typically it's going to be either a surviving spouse, a, su a surviving child or stepchild, uh, now in Washington, a registered domestic partner, surviving domestic partner, may also have a claim. And in some uh, limited circumstances, a surviving um, parent and a surviving um, sibling may have an individual claim for the loss of the uh, deceased. Number three, um, and this is a, um, a claim that is brought by a parent for the loss of a child. And it, uh, the, child, uh, the child is a minor in this situation. And the reason that this has a separate category is because there are different laws uh, applying to the loss of a minor child. Uh, there are different damages that the surviving parent can recover in that type of case. So three types of claims, and you may have all three claims um, in one case, in, in which case there would be separate damages recoverable by each the estate, a beneficiary, and a surviving parent. We can go to the next slide. Talk about the uh, estate's claim for damages. <coughs> when, when a wrongful death case uh, arises, uh, the, the wrongful death case can only be brought by what they call a personal representative. Uh, a personal representative is a person that's been appointed by the court to basically uh, bring the claim on behalf of the estate and make sure that the damages to the estate are recoverable, basically watch outs for the state's interest. So uh, the court usually, uh, paperwork has to be filed in the court where the person is appointed by the court. Typically the personal representative may be a family member. Sometimes the personal representative may be, a, for instance, a surviving spouse or a surviving uh, adult child. Uh, in other cases, the personal representative may be a professional, like an attorney uh, for the estate. Uh, and when the estate, when the estate brings a claim for damages in a wrongful death case, it, it has certain types of damages that the estate may recover. And then you see there, the first one would be the health care and funeral expenses. Uh, the health care would uh, be the medical treatment that the person, the deceased person, um, perhaps received before dying. And of course, the funeral expenses is self-explanatory. Um, the estate may also claim damages for the lost net earning accumulation. And all that means basically is that when the person who has been killed, if that person was employed and earning income, um, then the, the estate has a claim for the gross amount of the income that the person was expected to earn over the course of that person's work life, less um, consumption expenditures that the person may have used uh, during that time as well. So that's the reason for net earning accumulation. Basically, the amount of money that is left over uh, would be expected to be left over after a lifetime of earnings, less consumption, and other expenditures that people use to, to live upon. Typically, uh, or actually not typically, almost always the calculation of net accumulation has to be done by an expert. Uh, typically, it is a, an economist that will make the calculations and use, for instance, certain rate of return or inflation rates to calculate what the person would have earned over 10, 15, 20, whatever the, the time span is, and then reduce the expenditures and come up with a present value of the loss that the deceased uh, would have uh, likely earned over that person's work life history. Um, so if uh, the person who has been killed had a high paying job and perhaps that person was in the prime of that person's earning life, maybe in their mid to late 30s, or early 40s, um, if the person had a high paying job, then the net uh, earning accumulation loss could be substantial. I've had cases where the calculation has been in the millions of dollars. Um, typically, when you've got a case like that, uh, the insurance company will hire their own economist or their own accountant to come up with a different calculation. And because there's many different variables, unknown variables, that go into making the calculation, 
uh, this part of the claim can be fought quite hardly by the, uh, the, by the insurance company. So especially if you've got a high paying uh, person that's been killed uh, and the loss could potentially be worth a lot of money in the millions of dollars, the insurance company is likely going to spend a lot of money uh, to hire their experts to try to bring the value of that particular uh, claim down. Uh, then, of course, if the case were to go to trial, it would be up to a jury to decide which expert, which calculation is the more accurate uh, over the two. Sometimes juries uh, will split the middle. Sometimes they'll come in at one end or the other, de depending on what other facts exist in the claim. And finally, the estate also has a claim for pre-death pain and suffering and fear of death that the deceased might have experienced uh, before passing. Uh, for example, in a, in a case that I handled uh, last year, um, we were able to show that it was a car accident case where a woman died. We were able to show that the woman actually uh, made contact, eye contact with the other driver for a period of seconds. And um, with the help of a psychologist, we were able to, to establish that she likely would have experienced a substantial amount of fear knowing that she was about to be seriously hurt or killed. And so um, the law recognizes that and says that the estate has a claim for damages for that type of element. We can go to the next slide. talk about the beneficiary's claim. And again, I said that this is a surviving family member, and I've listed the family members that are recognized in the law. You'll notice the asterisk uh, by sibling and parent, and the reason for that, if you look at the bottom of the slide, uh, only a, si uh, a surviving sibling of the deceased or a surviving parent of the adult deceased, they can only pursue individual claims if they were financially dependent on the person that, uh, that died. Uh, don't ask me why that was the case, except I'll tell you that the, the wrongful death law in Washington is quite old. I believe it's near you know, 80, 90 years old, and so it goes back to the days when, when uh, the wrongful death laws were used to try to balance out the, the, the financial impact that uh, a death had on a family. Um, however, um, when you're dealing with a beneficiary claim, that surviving family member has an individual claim for certain damages, uh, namely the past and future benefits that the deceased uh, was expected to provide them. For instance, money, goods, services expected. For instance, if, if one of the, if the surviving family member is a child, if the child was receiving financial um, assistance, for instance, maybe for school or other uh, activities, then that child is going to have a claim for that amount of money um, as part of their overall claim. Um, in addition to economic benefits, loss of economic benefits, the surviving family member is going to have uh, a claim for the loss of the relationship, um, the loss of the love, affection, care, companionship, and emotional support that the deceased would have been expected to provide that surviving family member over the course of his or her life. Um, so, for instance, the a surviving spouse um, will have a claim for damages basically for the loss of uh, his or her husband or wife. Um, and again, there's no mathematical formula, but if you can show that the relationship loss was close, was loving, you have evidence and testimony to back that up, then the, that part of the claim could be quite large. I've seen cases where the the surviving spouse has actually recovered millions of dollars simply just because of the loss of the relationship. Uh, so again, it's going to depend, depend heavily on the facts of that individual relationship and the, the other facts involved in the case. It's important to note that, a, that a, this type of claim, a surviving family member cannot claim damages for emotional distress or suffering or anguish for the loss of their family member. And that really uh, seems kind of uh, absurd. Um, and the reason for it is simply because the wrongful death damages are dictated by statute. And right now, the statute and the case law simply does not allow damages, the emotional damages that flow to a surviving family member for the loss of their loved one. 
And it doesn't make sense to me, but, but that uh, is the current status of the law. If we can go to the next slide. Here is the third claim that we talked about earlier, our parents' claim for damages. And this is for a parent's loss of a minor child. And uh, you see uh, the same types of damage elements in this type of claim, namely that the parents have a, um, a claim for the medical care that the child received before death and the funeral expenses for the child. Uh, the parent also has a claim for damages for services or support that the minor child uh, might have been expected to provide the parent till the age of majority. We don't see this a lot, but for instance, if the child was actually uh, working, you know, I can think of an example, a childhood actor who might have had a, a substantial income and was supporting the parents in some way. So if that were the case, then this would be part of the, that damages that could be recoverable. Um, the loss, the relationship, obviously the parents are going to be devastated for the loss of the love, affection, care, and emotional support and companionship that their child was expected to bring them over the course of their lives. Uh, and finally, in this type of case, the parents do have a claim for damages stemming from, from their anguish and emotional distress and suffering that they individually sustained. Uh, as a result of losing their child. And uh, the reason that we see this damage element for this type of claim is simply because that's the law. It's written into the statute. And so the legislature determined that a parent should recover damages or have the opportunity to recover damages for their own emotional suffering that they are experiencing uh, from the death of their child. We can go to the next slide if there is one. No, I think we've reached the end. Presentation. So uh, to recap, uh, three types of, of claims that we see, each with a little uh, difference in the types of damages that we can recover from those types of claims. And again, the, the value is really going to depend on a number of factors, um, including the six that we went over uh, before. So at this point, I can open it up for questions if we have any, Megan. Thank you very much. And we do have a couple questions. Um, and again, uh, for everybody on the line, you should see a box on your screen where you can type in your question. Any questions will be kept confidential, um, but we can address them uh, right here, right now, if, if you have any. So um, I can start with the first question that has already come in. It says, when undertaking expenses for collection, are the attorneys or collection fees covered? Uh, say that again. It says, when undertaking expenses for collection, are the attorney's fees um, or the collection fees, are they already covered? I really don't understand the question. If, if uh, perhaps the person can, can expand on that. Collection okay. fees for the estate or? Um, let's see if they can clarify. Sure, we can just leave it there. Um, okay, well, there's another question that can, we can go on, move on to, and perhaps that person will clarify there. Okay. Next, next question. I got into an accident at work and didn't think anything of it. I told my supervisor I was fine, but a month later, I think my neck pain is due to the accident. Is it too late to file a lawsuit? Can I file a lawsuit? Uh, well, yes, you can. You in, in Washington, the statute of limitations is three years from the date of the accident. Uh, so you have plenty of time to file a lawsuit. The problem might be in trying to prove to the insurance company that you were injured if you hadn't received treatment for a month following the accident or that the treatment is related to the accident. If there, are, if there is a period of time between the accident and the first time that you see a doctor or seek medical attention, then the insurance company will heavily discount the value of the claim. In some cases, they may outright deny it because in their view, the argument is that if you were really injured, you would have sought treatment soon after the accident, usually within a week. Uh, but it's really going to depend on the identity of the insurance company involved and perhaps what the doctor says about your injury. Okay. Uh, another question has come in. I think this 
talks a bit about um, issues around insurance as well and says, doesn't all of this seem colossally unfair? If you get killed by an uninsured jerk, um, what do you do then? Because it seems like no lawyer will want to take the case. Uh, yes, I, I agree. It, it's, um, it very, it's totally unfair. And uh, I probably have to turn down a dozen cases or so every few months because there's really no insurance. But I would also add that there are things that, that we can do to prevent that from happening. For instance, if we're talking about um, car insurance, there's a specific type of coverage that will guard against that, underinsured or uninsured motorist coverage. Uh, so for instance, if you're hit by an uninsured driver, you still may have a claim for damages if you have uninsured motorist coverage under your own policy. That's why I always advise people, and in fact, I would probably argue that uninsured motorist coverage might be more important than liability coverage, which is designed to pay damages to, to others that you may cause. And the reason I say that is because oftentimes, statistically, most accidents are caused by people who are irresponsible. And uh, they're, they are not only irresponsible on the road, they're usually financially irresponsible. So many times the accidents are caused by people who just don't bother to, to purchase their own policy. So I always tell people that they should carry as much uh, uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage that they can afford, preferably with at least limits of $250,000 to $300,000 per person per accident. And you'll find that the, that the cost of this type of insurance is usually much lower than compared with the liability insurance, the type of insurance that you have to carry uh, in case that you harm somebody else. OK. Uh, next question. I was at work. Um, I slipped and fell and hurt my arm. And now I'm doing physical therapy. However, my company is forcing me to go to physical therapy during lunch break um, rather than letting me take the time off. However, uh, my company is offering to pay the medical bills that my insurance company won't cover. They won't cover all of my physical therapy. Is this OK? Um, well, there's a couple of issues there. Uh, one, if, if the accident happened at work, <clears throat> then technically, it would be a workers' comp claim, and uh, a worker uh, a claim should be open with the Department of Labor and Industries, and uh, the claim would be covered. the The healthcare treatment would be covered by L and I. <clears throat> um, now, as far as your employer making you uh, take the treatment or set or do the treatment during your lunch hour, uh, that's probably not. Uh, legal. Um, there is there are laws out there that basically state that an employer cannot uh, retaliate against you for making an LNI claim or for pursuing medical treatment if it's medically necessary. <clears throat> so, I probably would advise you to have a talk with your boss and tell them that uh, if you know, especially if it's not. Um, um, feasible to do the, the treatment during your lunch hour, that you want the opportunity to do it when the therapist or when the doctor says it might be necessary during other times of the day. I would certainly document that, maybe write your boss a note, keep a copy of it for your file. Um, but the fact that your employer is also perhaps paying uh, for some of your treatment, uh, they don't have to do that. Um, so that's a good thing. So you might actually be getting a benefit here that, that your employer is not legally obligated to provide. So uh, on the one hand, you know, talking to your employer about uh, doing the treatment during your lunch hour, uh, they may then, if, if you do that, they may uh, stop paying for your other treatment. So I, I would probably have to weigh the two together and make a decision on that. OK. Again, everybody, just to remind everybody on the line, please do, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to write them in now. Um, looks we like we just... Do we have a question on the other question at all? Uh, no, they did not write back. So, 
Um, I have another question that just popped up, though. It says, my family was in a major car accident, um, and several people were killed, including my niece. How do we decide if we should get together with the other victims to file a lawsuit against the person who was the cause of the accident, or how do we decide if we should file suit um, on our own? Well, that's a very complicated question, and, and uh, I think in that situation that you should consult with an experienced attorney right away. Um, uh, one of the issues here is if, if there are multiple claims, multiple wrongful death claims, then there may be an issue about whether the insurance coverage that's available, whether that's enough to cover each claim. Um, and so sometimes the, the claimants that pursues the claim first might have a superior position in getting more insurance proceeds for that claim than the other claim. So uh, I would probably not consult with the other uh, families uh, because of that. Uh, there may be a conflict now that, that you might have with the other family members if there is only a set amount or an inadequate amount of insurance coverage to pay all the claims. At the very least, you should contact an experienced wrongful death lawyer and uh, go over the, um, the case with that lawyer so that the lawyer then can make an intelligent decision about whether to file suit now um, to preserve your superiority in the insurance proceeds or not. But I definitely would consult with a lawyer now. Don't wait for the other claimants. Do it now and find one yourself. Okay. I don't see any other questions right now, um, so I think that we can wrap this up for today. Thank you again, everybody, uh, for attending and for asking your questions. Um, and thank you, of course, to Mr. Davis for providing um, some really valuable information and um, many uh, good tips and resources um, for us to take with us today. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you.